you very much for attending today's conversation. Um, my name is Matthew Charlton, and I am the Sales and Marketing Manager at Academic Studies Press. Uh, we are the publishers of Israel Charney's latest book and the topic of our discussion today, Israel's Failed Response to the Armenian Genocide, Denial, State Deception, Truth versus Politicization of History. Uh, before I have the honor of introducing our guest today, um, just a few housekeeping items. So our presentation will be split into a few different parts. Uh, first, each of our panelists will speak individually for about five to 10 minutes. Then we'll have about 15 minutes of conversation between all three. And then we've allowed for an additional 15 minutes for questions and answers. Um, if you do have questions, uh, feel free to type those into the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen and we'll address those at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you're watching this on Facebook Live, we do not have anybody monitoring questions on that page. Uh, so you would have to move to the Zoom presentation if you would like to pose a question. Uh, this event will be recorded and a link will be sent out to all registrants within 48 hours. Uh, it will also be available on our website and on our social media accounts. Um, and if you are interested in obtaining a copy of the book, you can do so at our website, academicstudiespress.com. Uh, we're actually offering a 30% discount uh, with the promotion code Charney. Uh, that will be in the email that goes out to everybody at the end of the event as well. Uh, and with that, I would like to briefly introduce our three panelists today. Um, first, the author of the book, uh, Dr. Israel W. Charney, is an American Israeli psychologist who lives in the hills of Jerusalem. He was co-founder and then a president of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. He was also the founder and the first president of the Israel Family Therapy Association. Uh, we also welcome Harut Sasonian, who is the publisher of the California Courier newspaper and the president of Armenia Artsa Fund. Uh, he has a master's in international affairs from Columbia University. He served as human rights delegate to the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland for 10 years from 1978 to 1988. And not last but not least, um, we also welcome Michael Berenbaum, an Emmy award-winning producer and consultant, as well as an editor, author, speaker, and teacher, and one of America's foremost Holocaust scholars. He is the director of the Siggy Zering Institute for Holocaust Studies at American University, and previously oversaw the creation of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's Research Institute, uh, serving as project director from 1988 to 1993. So welcome to all three of you, uh, and thank you very much for being here. Uh, and with that, um, I'd like to just turn it right over to Dr. Charney. Thank you, Matthew. Hello, everybody. Shalom, Barev. That's the Armenian for hello, for those who don't know. This is, from a book point of view, a happy event of celebrating a new work and making it available to you. But I'm going to begin with a serious word of sorrow and condolence to the Armenian people for the losses of life in Karabakh, which also becomes part of the subject that we're dealing with tonight. And I'm going to add a, a comment that when I focus on the Armenian people's victim experience, I do not mean by that in any way to ignore the tragedy of losses of life to the other side, which means perpetrators. And I'm reminded of the advice in the Old Testament book of Proverbs that we are not to rejoice in the deaths of our enemies. And to the statement of sorrow, I want to add another statement of my own personal shame, deep shame, and my own sense of guilt as a Jew and as an Israeli for the role that Israel has played in being a denier of the Armenian genocide and in being a supplier of arms promiscuously, including to countries engaging in genocide, and I hope to make a remark about that later, 
and to countries that are anticipated as potentially going to engage in destructive warfare and the continuum relating to genocide. And that was the case with Azerbaijan, to whom Israel continued to sell the most devastating arms that we understand played a major role in the defeat of the Armenians in this last combat. The main message that I want to get across tonight, I'll begin with my conclusion. I believe that we need in Israel a concerted public opinion battle on a year round basis. First of all, to battle against denial of the Armenian genocide. And as I hope to comment, to battle against denials of empathy and connection to a number of other genocides that are ongoing in the world today. So that goal number two is to battle against the moral indifference that Israel has adopted as a policy in response to genocidal events of other peoples. Our involvement in our overwhelming and tragic genocide, the Holocaust, is totally correct and understandable, but it never should have been taken as a basis for reducing human and Jewish values of concern for the other peoples who suffer these tragedies. A third goal that I want to support deeply is the development of regulations in Israel regarding the sales of arms. There are some countries, Canada for example, that have a code that arms sales are not okayed when they're heading for a country that is involved as a genocider or potential genocider. Israel has not exercised any such moral code. It is understandable that everything that I've said leads also to a broad concept of a goal against, of a battle against fake news and against big lies. But most of all, and this is the last goal that I wanna define, I believe strongly that the time has come for Israel to redefine its foreign policy to include not only totally legitimate self-defense and self-interest as a first goal, but to include moral and spiritual considerations and that Israel Jewishly and as the state whose potential was to embody that Jewish philosophy should become a leader in the struggle for human rights around the world, a real contributor to it. As I said, not at the expense of our first and primary responsibility, which is self-defense, but yes, along with it in an integrated way. Now, I'm happy to add that in Israel, there is a tremendous public opinion standing for recognition of the Armenian genocide. I have here, for example, an editorial quite recently from the Jerusalem Post. Israel must recognize the Armenian genocide editorial. Jewish communities elsewhere in the world. Here is from the Jewish Chronicle in London. All Jews have a moral duty to recognize the Armenian genocide. A diplomat in Europe who represents a group of parliamentarians who call themselves intriguingly the Elie Wiesel network of parliamentarians in Europe says Israel has, and I'm quoting, a particular responsibility in recognizing the Armenian genocide to ensure mass atrocities are prevented in the future. 
it is the machinations of government that have led for years to Israel's failing to recognize the genocide. Any number of our finest leaders, such as the current president, Rivlin, when he was chairman of the Knesset, and many others have stood up for such recognition, but have never gathered together a successful political process to achieve it. And it is totally legitimate that Armenian voices call out to Israel, such as an historian in Jerusalem by the name of George Hintlian, who says, it's your turn, Israel, to be more universal and belong to the community of nations. I'm going to add, I believe Israel's responsibility is certainly to the Armenians. It is moreover to the world, but I'm going to add that I believe it is also to itself, that Israel is harming itself deeply by not developing a proud sense of being a leader morally for just values. There's a fair amount of scientific evidence that shows that even the will to live of people is affected by the extent of their pride in their national ethnic religious identities. And anybody who knows Israel knows that there are millions of us who are suffering at this time a grievous regret and disappointment at the failure of our country to rise to that level. I'm gonna conclude my brief remarks with the fun of quoting two celebrated people. I think each is a bit of a surprise. The first one is a guy called George Washington, <laughs> whom I was amazed to find was an excellent writer. Here we're back to books again and had beautiful things to say so articulately. I'm quoting Washington. Virtue or morality is a necessary spring of government. The rule indeed extends with more or less force to every species of free government. Who that is a sincere friend to it can look with indifference upon attempts to shake the foundation of the fabric. And my last quotation for these brief remarks is from a rather well-known scientist and philosopher named Albert Einstein, who I believe was also approached with the offer to be the first president of Israel. And Einstein, who played a major role in the development of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, visited Israel in the 1920s. And he wrote with his amazing prescient wisdom, the Zionist movement must avoid the danger of degenerating into a blind nationalism. He saw the arrogance and the lack of empathy of certain Zionist settlers, as did any number of Jewish leaders, even in those early years. I think it's a trademark of colonial people, the, the colonists. When they go in to conquer a new territory, they've got their guns on their hips, they're protecting their lives, and a certain kind of grandeur of power and lack of respect for others awaits many who succumb to it. Thank God not all succumb to it at all. And there've been many beautiful connections between Jews and Arabs, but the basic development of a moral attitude has failed in Israel and is deeply reflected in the failure to recognize the Armenian genocide. I'm gonna stop there and 
turn the microphone over to my dear colleague, Harut Sassoonian. Thank you, Israel. That was wonderful. I would like to start my comments by thanking you personally for your long years of commitment and dedication and unspokenness on behalf of the recognition of the Armenian genocide, which is a, a great humanitarian thing to do. And recognition is not just something in favor of Armenians, it's in favor of humanity. And coming to the state of Israel, I always say that rather than being the very last state to recognize the Armenian genocide, Israel should have been the first one to recognize it many decades ago, because who else more, knows more about genocide that, than another victim of, of genocide? And Israel, by recognizing the Armenian genocide, will not be doing a favor to Armenians. It will be doing a favor to itself. It will finally be able to join the group of civilized nations who value historical truth and morality as much as we recognize that we live in a world of real politique where anything goes and mostly uh, monetary interests, but there must be a limit to everything. Coming to uh, the recent recognition of the Armenian genocide by President Biden, I believe that uh, it took way too long since 1981 when President Reagan mentioned the Armenian genocide in a passing remark in his presidential proclamation. And we've been struggling for 40 years uh, trying to get the president to use the words Armenian genocide rather than all sorts of other synonyms, which are sometimes become very silly given the gravity of the tragedy. The, what I'm gonna say about the United States also applies to the state of Israel. The United States for decades were concerned that if they use the word genocide, all hell will break loose. Turkey will leave NATO, will close down the NATO base in Injerlik, stop trade, etc. I've been saying for years that all of these are bluffs. United States does not need Turkey. It's the other way around. Turkey needs United States. And all this bluffing should not scare anybody. At, at the least, uh, the US government should have announced long ago that regardless of, of our alliance in NATO, we cannot distort historical facts. We have to tell the truth, something that happened over a century ago. The US presidents, and I've spoken at least uh, to one of them personally in the White House, President Clinton, who admitted what I just said, his concern about Turkish backlash. And I tried to reassure him that there won't be any except some initial uh, complaints for a couple of days, be forgotten, and it will be back to business as usual, which is exactly what happened after Biden uttered the words genocide, after being warned of dire consequences, should he do so? And we saw that nothing happened. And that's what exactly what I've been saying. And Israel has been making the same mistake. The minute you start ca catering, caving in to a denialist state to go along with their distortion of history, then they got you under a gun and uh, you, then you cannot escape from that. From day one, you have to put them on notice that we cannot escape from the truth, we have to face reality, face history, regardless of what our relations are now, good or bad, but history does not change as a relationship changes. And we've seen how Israel and Turkey have gone through many phases of good and bad relationships. When the relationships were good, Israeli leaders use the excuse that we cannot say genocide because it would ruin our alliance. And when the relationship was bad, again, they came up with another meaningless uh, excuse saying relationship is bad. We don't want to make it worse. So uh, if it's good, 
it's not the right time. If it's bad, it's not the right time. Well, when is the right time? It's been a century. Will there ever be a right time to do the right thing? I believe that time was many decades ago and it's not too late now. Israel leaders following the good example of President Biden, they should reconsider their position. And it's amazing that the Israeli government is able to withstand all these repeated vile insults against Jews and Israel, and which is not just a one-time thing. It's been repeated for years. Let's face it, President Erdogan is an anti-Semite and he makes it very clear and he talks about it publicly and rather than admit his own government's predecessor's guilt and crime, he accuses surprisingly Israel of genocide or committing Holocaust. Uh, so the time has come long past that Israel faces the truth and uh, describes the events of the genocide using the right word and uh, just face the truth. Finally, the, uh, I just lost my thought for a second. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I just remembered. The, I would like to make it very clear that when we criticize the government of Israel, we have to draw a clear distinction between the government and the people of Israel and the uh, Jewish people worldwide. The good news is that a huge number of Jewish, just regular people, particularly Jewish scholars, have been on the forefront of the research on the Armenian genocide. And Professor Israel Charney is one of the main ones. There are many others. In fact, Raphael Lemkin, who coined the term genocide, uh, was of Jewish background. Uh, Henry Morgenthau, the, the US ambassador in the Ottoman Empire, who uh, sent the alarms about the incoming genocide, he was Jewish. And I can go on and name many other scholars who've been on the forefront. So no one should misunderstand our criticism of the Israeli government as, as a criticism of Jews in general. That would be a very unfair and, and wrong. I would like to stop here. Thank you. First of all, I, um, I'm Michael Birnbaum and I'm happy to participate in this event. Uh, also was happy to contribute a chapter um, to Israel Charney's book. Let me first uh, congratulate uh, Israel Charney on the publication of his work. Uh, it is a wonderful achievement for a scholar who has reached four score and seven to continue to be productive. You mentioned George Washington, so I might as well invoke uh, Abraham Lincoln, who has reached four score and seven to um, uh, remain a productive and accomplished scholar and one who looks to the future and not the past. Um, I feel that acutely the older I get and the more respect I have for those who remain productive uh, well into what the Bible would call the years of um, uh, your strength. Let me also um, say that I have uh, that that we must say that denial is one of the stages of genocide. And um, one of the contributions of Greg Staten and also of Israel Charney has been to remind us that. Uh, denial is one of the very important stages of genocide <clears throat> because it allows for forgetfulness and also allows one to deny responsibility. The most remarkable thing, again, that we've had with regard to the Holocaust is that the perpetrators do not deny their crime, but outsiders do that in reality, if anybody should have denied, you have the situation where former President Ahmadinejad of um, 
Iran denied the Holocaust and the president of Germany and the chancellor of Germany were the ones to respond to them. And the irony is that one should not hold Ahmadinejad accountable for understanding German history, but he didn't even understand the history of his own people. And the history of his own people have quite an impressive record of rescue during the Holocaust. And the other part of it is that even during the Holocaust, there were denial of the crime, at least publicly, while there, there was a great um, proclamation of the crime privately. One thinks of Himmler's speech of October 4th, 1943 at, Pon at Poznan, who says a great, this is a great chapter in German history, never to be written, never to be told. And yet in the back of the room, there is a recording of his remarks and we even have his notes for the remarks because it was something he was proud of. My contribution, let me iterate my contribution to um, this um, book and, my, um, uh, and I was pleased to do it, is my experience was with the force of, Holocaust, uh, of genocide denial um, when I was in charge in this uh, slight correction, Matthew, I was the project director over, overseeing the creation of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And one of the issues was how do we consider the Armenian genocide? And like uh, Harut Sunian, uh, we understood that the very use of the word genocide invented by, um, by Raphael Lemkin to combine two words, geno and side, the murder of a genus, the murder of an entire group. The very invocation of the word genocide was, was invented to speak of the Armenian genocide. We thought that in the uh, opening um, film of the museum, a film that's not seen by every visitor, but it's on the rise of Nazism from 1918 to 1933. Ironically, a rise that is now more important in our world as we see the um, weakening of democracy, the rise of authoritarian, and perhaps in the future totalitarian regimes. We would include a brief history on the origin of the word genocide and speak explicitly of the uh, Armenian genocide as a precedent. And uh, what we found was that Israel lobbied very strongly. Um, they lobbied me personally and they lobbied uh, the lay people who were uh, in charge of uh, the museum uh, for the council uh, about doing this, invoking matters of state. When an Israeli embassy official lobbied me, I said, um, uh, number one, uh, we've received no lobbying from the United States government as to how to present the record of the United States during the Holocaust. And number two, um, we are responsible to have historical credibility. And if we politicize historical credibility on one issue, we will, we will be accused and be guilty of politicizing his, uh, history on another issue. And therefore I asked him to leave because there was nothing for us to discuss. It was an inappropriate uh, approach. They did um, approach uh, our lay leaders and they put enormous pressure. We had a uh, drag out, knock down, drag out meeting in, in which this issue um, uh, was discussed and we did not proceed uh, much to uh, my regret with the um, use of the origin of the word genocide. And I think that made the exhibition slightly less credible than it would have been otherwise. Uh, we did include references to the Armenian genocide in two other places that um, were um, appropriate historically. Number one, in the uh, famous remarks of Adolf Hitler uh, on the eve of the war with Poland, which was who remembers the Armenians, uh, in which he was speaking to uh, German generals. And um, that um, was one version of that conversation, uh, which was uh, done by the American journalist, Louis Lochner. Uh, and we did include reference to that. We also included reference to um, uh, uh, 40 days in Musada, 
and the invocation by the rebels in Bialystok of 40 days in Musada, but we backed off the basic uh, claim of genocide. Let me also add that um, since then, lots of people have backed, lots of government officials have backed away from genocide, revealing something very intriguing. Glemkin believed that if we articulated the name and named the crime and made it illegal, we could prevent it. And now we see government after government after government going through contortions not to use the G word, not to use the genocide word because of its implications and its responsibility. Um, let me talk for a moment. Israel's record, I know in the 1980s and early 90s on this is clear. There have been efforts ever since by Israel to um, uh, have parliament pass a resolution regarding the Armenian genocide. And um, I have uh, taken a bizarre stance that uh, many of my friends, including one on this conversation, uh, castigated me for, Jack Porter is here, castigated me for. I said, Israel's lost the opportunity. And that is stay out of it, parliament, let historians and scholarship and institutions dealing with the Holocaust and genocide deal with the Armenian experience. Stay out of it because the moment you put it up for a vote is the moment you're saying we are politicizing history and that legitimates all politic politicalization of history. And governments have their own political interests at stake, uh, which uh, then says that it's legitimate to politicize the history. And pretty soon we will have people saying Let's not deal and let's not, and I say this to Israel in its own self interest, let's not deal, let's not mention the Holocaust for fear of offending Germans and for fear of um, uh, condoning certain behaviors of the Israeli government that we do not uh, like. And all of a sudden we have a politicized history. Historians and academics, and the irony is we should say that scholarship both of the Holocaust and of the Armenian Genocide uh, is uh, broad based in multi disciplines with scholars of all vantage points. Israel himself is not by training a historian, but a psychologist. I, by training, am a historian of religion. Uh, my friend Lawrence Langer is a literary scholar who's done amazing work on the Holocaust. Uh, Raul Hilberg, the dean of Holocaust studies, was a political scientist, not a historian. So we have to say scholars working in their field have to work with absolute uncompromised integrity and they can't allow the politicalization of their own work to go forth and they can't use and abuse events to score political points. Uh, I think that the most remarkable thing in Turkey has been that Turkey could have admitted the crime uh, 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 um, perpetrated by a different government which, against which they had rebelled, against which they had resisted, a uh, pre, an earlier government. And if they had admitted it, they would have gotten it out of the way. Last comment, which is a paradox um, that we find very often in genocide um, and most particularly in the Holocaust, is that the innocent feel guilty and the guilty feel innocent. <laughs> and that is that there is a vast literature of survivor guilt. There is a very small literature of perpetrator guilt. And the remarkable thing is that those who don't break with that past are actually condoning it, accepting it, and in one sense, inviting its repetition. And that's what's horrific about the denial. Integrity demands that you admit the crime, that you depict it, you study it, you understand it, you confront it, you grapple with it, and you deal with it. And you do that without political considerations. So I think that I'm, I welcome the American recognition of, of uh, the Armenian Genocide. Uh, we wrestled back in 1979 on April 24th with how to include 
the Armenians in the Holocaust in the first national Holocaust remembrance in the Capitol. And there was an oblique reference to it by Jimmy Carter way back in 1979. It is long overdue. But having said that, I think that by now Israel's um, rec Israel's hands are um, are um, so um, uh, tainted on this that the parliament should not consider it, should abandon it, leave it, get it behind it, and not politicize history. The moment they bring it to a vote, uh, and let's assume it goes 61-59, uh, the moment they bring it a vote, they've already tainted it because they politicized it. Thank you. I gather it's time for the three of us to speak with one another. Well, uh, Israel, if, if I may, I failed in my introductory remarks to thank you personally for this incredible work you've done. Uh, who would have thought that it's possible to go into the foreign ministry, Israel foreign ministry archives and get their own documents. Of course, you've been writing and talking about this for years about the 1982 conference, but now we have the, uh, the actual goods, the proof from the horse as so to speak horse's mouth and, uh, and no, no one can escape from these, these archives. They're incredible. They're wonderful. They're like uh, reading a James Bond novel, uh, <laughs> that, that tracing their uh, schemes and lies and distortions and a very shameful uh, record. And you, you've uh, documented this and it's a great, great book. I recommend everyone interested in, in this subject to get a copy because we need to make this book a bestseller. And uh, once again, I thank you. I thank you for your uh, humanitarianism. I thank you for your uh, friendship. And uh, I, I just hope that uh, your efforts uh, at, at long last will uh, bear some fruit and, uh, and make uh, people, especially Israeli leaders, see the light. Thank you, and I'll have the fun of a comment that the wisdom to go into the foreign ministry documents belongs to a young student who had the foresight and the guts to work the process within the framework of the laws that allow for release of certain information after many years of their being classified as secret and top secret. And that student brought me several hundred pages of the documents from the foreign ministry. And I proceeded to have one of the major experiences of my life reading it. But I, I thank that student and I, do not identify that student by name. I actually offer the student the opportunity of being identified as co-author of the book because of that wonderful contribution. But the student, I think wisely said, I've got too many challenges ahead in my development as a student and the degrees that I want to gather and the academic career that I want to develop. And I fear that there may be a backlash to my being identified as the person who broke the secret documents. And that student chose not to accept the position of co-author, but I, in my heart, I am full of thanks and admiration. Let me ask Israel a question. Israel, how do you think your book is going to be received in Israel? The predictions that have been made by several people, for example, the wonderful foreword to the book is written by Professor Yair Aron of Israel. And among other things, he says, 
I think there will be many people in Israel surprised by this book and not exactly happy with it. Nonetheless, in the three weeks since the book has been published, uh, I have been a very busy person responding to interviews by a number of newspapers and the coverage has been extensive and very, very positive. Obviously, there are people who are going to be very unhappy. And that's the name of the process we're in. But my real hope, Michael, is that the book will prove to be not just a reading experience, and I'm glad it's a fun reading experience for a lot of people, but I hope it will be more than that. I hope it will be a trigger for a real concerted policy of action to gain recognition. You know that I don't, and you refer to it, that I don't agree with you that we should not pursue that through the Israeli Knesset. And I think my answer to your last point is, I don't want a 6159. I want something like happened in the US Senate, where amazingly, the vote was a unanimous one to recognize the Armenian genocide. So I don't want to slow down the battle. I want to increase it. Where there's shall a, we go ahead? There's a, there's a question in, in the chat that's aimed at me because I was uh, executive producer of, um, of um, Desperate Hours, which the, um, uh, the questioner says was a propaganda uh, thing. I haven't changed my position on <clears throat> the Armenian genocide since I first studied the Armenian genocide. That does not preclude dealing with the historical record of Turkey during the Holocaust. And uh, what we did was to discover several elements of the experience in Turkey. And we thought that it had elements, uh, it had the elements of a good film. And that's what we did. I did not regard it as a propaganda arm of, of the Turks. And anybody who knows the historical record knows that my position has been um, uh, consistent all the way through my professional career. And I'm an empiricist. I am moved by evidence and I take evidence where it leads me. And I'm always willing to change my mind when evidence uh, comes forth for me. So I don't regard desperate hours in any way as conflicting with the depiction of Turkey's role during the uh, Armenian genocide. So I in plain English, do we or do we not, in your judgment, credit the Turks with having played a particularly positive role in saving Jews during the Holocaust? One has to say the following. Uh, Turkey, let, let's, let's explain that in a very basic way. Turkey uh, was a neutral power. Because it was neutral power, it was location uh, in East, it was location for all sorts of intelligence agencies working within, within um, Turkey. The Yishuv had a very, the Yishuv, which is the uh, Jewish community of Palestine, pre-state, had a very, very active intelligence network that worked out of Turkey. It tried to rescue from there as many Hungarian Jews and Romanian Jews as it did. It had unique cooperation from the man who was the, apostol who was the um, apostolic delegate in Istanbul, and that was uh, the man who was now St. John the 23rd, who was then Archbishop Roncalli, who worked with the Yishuv. And in the words of Yehuda Bauer, he said, we don't know what he did very accurately but he worked with us and that was sufficient. Uh, we did discover that he issued a, a range of false documents. Turkey also had a demonstrated role in the 1930s of inviting Jewish uh, scholars of Jewish origin or Jewish scholars who were um, expelled from Germany or forced to leave their positions in Germany 
to come into Germany, to come into Turkey, to revise the architecture, the music, the uh, legal and the medical professions, as well as some of the scholarly profession. Among the people invited were Eric Orbach, who wrote Mesis in Turkey. They paid them uh, three times the going salary. They gave them uh, five-year contracts, uh, which were designed precisely to protect them and shake them up. And Turkey was also the scene of uh, a disaster, which was the Struma, uh, in which uh, uh, 600, I think it's 659 passengers were killed. And we interviewed the lone survivor who was opening a door when the ship was torpedoed and uh, ended up floating in the, uh, in the river on uh, the door that he had been opening and was really the lone survivor. So Turkey's role was uh, important um, and its role was in certain respects mixed. There were positive and negative aspects to it and a good deal of effort, most of it uh, inadequate, most of it not successful, good deal of effort at rescue went forth from Turkey. And that's what we dealt with in a very basic way. Turkey also had the one Muslim um, until recently who was honored by uh, Yad Vashem for being a righteous Gentile. And that is that the Turks treated their Jews as citizens and consequently protected them in France and protected them also in Rhodes. And the man by the name of Ulkaman was the one um, righteous Gentile who is Muslim, honored by Yad Vashem, was a Turk. And we got to interview him shortly before his death. So we wrote, uh, we dealt with in the film what we found. I think we dealt with him truthfully. And it had literally nothing to do with my opinion as to whether indeed what happened in Turkey was or was not a genocide. Um, and uh, the other thing is that uh, Israel knows, and I don't want to focus on it, which is that I faced enormously heavy pressure um, on, um, uh, for advocating inclusion, including of the Armenians and any number of um, other scholars involved in the Holocaust Museum backed off and did not uh, fight uh, hard enough for that. And, um, and uh, uh, the one exception um, bears mentioning and that's the late Franklin Mattel. Yeah, I certainly am aware of your sterling record personally, Michael. And you may not remember that I saw you on the night when you came from that decisive meeting of the board of directors at the Holocaust Museum where they turned down the fuller proposal to recognize the Armenian genocide that you described. And man, you looked like hell that night. I mean, you were one beaten guy and my heart went out to you as a colleague, as a friend, I, I knew what you had been through. But I'm, I'm still puzzled on, on a plain everyday level of language. Were the Turks particularly good to the Jews in helping them escape the Holocaust or not? Because they use as a major propaganda point that they were, therefore we shouldn't think of them as people who are committed to something malicious and we should not get so involved in the way they regard the Armenians. Did they really help the Jews out in a way that is deserving of historical credit collectively? The answer to that is there is evidence that they gave help to the Jews. Was it adequate and did it turn the tide? It did not. And the other part of it, which I always um, uh, was suspicious of, which is they said that if uh, Israel or in, we in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum recognized the Armenian genocide, that would have been endangering to the Jewish, uh, to the Jewish community in Turkey. If you have citizens of your own country who happen to be of the Jewish faith, 
uh, nothing that happens elsewhere should endanger them. They have the rights of citizenship. And one of the full requirements of uh, at 20, late 20th and early 20th century citizenship is protect, protection by the country of which you're a citizen. So I found that request uh, less than honorable on the part of the Turks. I have no problem speaking about the Turkish efforts to help the Jews. Um, and most especially to help their own Jews, Turkish citizens. And we provided evidence of that. Just, just to set the record straight, I would like to present also the other side of Turkish misbehavior towards uh, Jews in, in Turkey and uh, elsewhere, where, uh, for example, in the 1940s, the Turkish government established exorbitant tax in Turkish called Varlik Bergesi against Armenians, Turks, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jews and Greeks, right. where they drove them into bankruptcy and took away their wealth and gave them to Turkey. Uh, and we do, we, do, we do say that in the film and we yeah. consider that. Uh, yeah. And remember in many Muslim countries, historically, Jews had a special tax imposed upon them. Part of what we're also dealing with in Turkish phenomenon is the, que is the question of um, how do we include in a Muslim country those who are non-Muslims uh, in the same way that Israel is struggling with the question, how do you include in quotation marks a Jewish state non-Jews? And in uh, the United States, we're grappling with the issue with the United States is indeed a Christian country. How do you deal with non-Christians? And the United States, by its tradition, is a secular country, which establishes freedom of religion, which is freedom for religion, and freedom from government interference in religion. So uh, Turkey had a mixed record. There is no question about that. There was discrimination and the like. But again, Jews uh, were safe there. Uh, in a neutral country and compared to what was happening elsewhere that was already a virtue. And some Turks living in other countries were repatriated, but our issue is not to consider Turkey's role during the Holocaust. Our issue is to consider the, the uh, genocide against the Armenians and the recognition of genocide of, uh, against the Armenians and that's a very important task, uh, which Israel does very well in the book itself. We do have, um, just to jump in here, we do have just about five minutes left, um, but I just wanted to get to a few questions um, from the, the Q&A, and I'm combining questions here, um, but uh, some of the attendees uh, would be curious to know uh, Israel's experience with the 1982 conference um, and also um, Eli Wiesel's involvement in it and justification for why um, he ended up opposing the conference. Well, one, one of the keys in the book is that those oft-repeated threats by the Turks that you spoke about, Michael, and that others have reported in other instances uh, where Turkey has explicitly threatened Jewish lives was brought up by the Israeli foreign ministry to us as the reason that they were against our proceeding with the conference. And first they demanded that we eliminate all lectures on the Armenian genocide and we refused. Then they went on and demanded that we not allow any Armenian scholars to participate and we refused. And on and on it went with a whole bunch of oppressive measures against me personally in my university, against our fund sources. All the time they were emphasizing the Turks may cut off the escape routes that Jews were free to use from Syria and Iraq through Turkey that were saving their lives. And it was my job to evaluate those risks. I had no question that if there was a real threat to Jewish lives, we had to pay the price 
and stop the conference, as nothing is more precious than human life. But I researched it and came to the conclusion such as you described, Harut, that first of all, the Turks shout off, they blabber at the mouth their threats, they've done it in several countries, and very little comes from it. But I still am just a little guy, and it was such a big issue, I turned to the US State Department and I asked for their help to evaluate, is there a risk? And I was delighted with the full assistance that they gave me and the absolutely explicit answer. They said in their judgment, there was no risk whatsoever. And now what we found out from the one secret documents is the following. A few days before the conference took place, and it did take place, and it was successful, throw away all the rumors that it didn't take place. A high official in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs received a cable from our chief consul in Turkey. The chief consul said, Nice going the way you're pressuring this conference and trying to get rid of it. You've done a terrific job cutting off its arms and its legs. But one thing puzzles me. Your main argument has been that the Turks are threatening Jewish lives, that they're gonna cut off the escape routes of Jews. And I'm telling you as the consul here in Turkey, I have not heard a word of any such threats. That's the smoking gun that the book reveals. And the document is repeated, reprinted in full in the book. It turns out that the Israel Foreign Ministry took this well-known historic threat by Turkey and posed it as if it were a factual threat that had been imposed about the conference and did everything possible to cancel us on that basis. And that was an expression of Israel's policy of trying to mollify and get along with Turkey. And I object to that deeply, specifically in the events that took place and as a general principle. I think a country, a democratic country should stand up with dignity for truth and justice. And I feel that very strongly. We've been asked another question, Matthew, which is an intriguing question. Do we believe that uh, Elie Wiesel and Shimon Peres would have continued to act like that at a later stage in the evolution of their careers? And I presume by that we mean when they, be, they, when they began to play in a very different way on a world stage. Um, we have one explicit piece of information on that regarding Elie Wiesel, and that is there came a point, oh, probably about uh, 10 years ago, in which um, Abe Foxman, who was then the national director of the Anti-Defamation League, um, would not use the G word with regard to the Armenian genocide. And he backed off from that saying, I approached Elie Wiesel, and Elie Wiesel said uh, it was a genocide, and therefore I was wrong. I say it was a genocide. But remember, that also took place at a moment in time when Israel's relationship with Turkey were to say the best chili, uh, if, not more, if not more than that. So there is a correlation, and Wiesel was probably put on, I can uh, assume this, was put under pressure with precisely the, the type of language Israel used uh, and Israel Charney used. And consequently, he probably said to himself, I cannot be party in endangering uh, Jews um, and backed off from, um, from his participation. It was not a shining moment in Wiesel's career, but remember he, be, he evolved um, uh, as a leader, um, most especially after he had the Nobel Peace Prize, 
when he saw himself in a very different role. Um, and that's speculation we do not know. We have one piece of mixed historical evidence. I, I write a great deal about Elie Wiesel in the book and bring some of the original correspondence between him and me. I loved the man and in the retrospect, continue to love and appreciate his great leadership as a Holocaust survivor in calling attention to the genocides of many other peoples. I appreciated his position at the beginning of our story where he joined me in opposing the Israeli insistence that we remove the Armenian genocide from the program. But what I do point out in the book and will comment on now, I hope respectfully, is that one quality of Eli Wiesel, a personal quality, was that he flipped and he flopped. And both sides were expressed by him alternately arbitrarily. For example, long after he and I were in conflict about the 1982 conference, he and I had reconciled personally. I visited him in New York. He opened the door and threw his arms around me. We were together again. And in the months that followed, I invited him to speak at a conference that we were planning, but didn't take place in Hiroshima. And Eli A agreed to speak, which means he's relating to the fate of the mass deaths of another people. And on the other hand, he wrote me a letter and I'm quoting where he says, do not use the word genocide in plural. I don't think he ever freed himself from the ambivalence he had about recognizing fully the genocides of other peoples beyond the Holocaust, which totally understandably occupied him fully and should occupy all of us enormously. But it was not the only genocide at all in the world, then or now. Let's make explicit one more thing for the record. Um, by the time the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum voted on um, uh, whether or not to include uh, the Armenian genocide, uh, Elie Wiesel was not affiliated with the museum. It happened under different uh, uh, administrative leadership, different board members. He had, was no longer chairman he had uh, dropped off the chairmanship uh, about uh, five years before, four or five years earlier. And, and Wiesel was um, deeply committed to the uniqueness of the Holocaust. Um, it became an axiom for him. Uh, but you also should recall that he challenged um, American presidents on action, for example, at the inauguration of the Holocaust Museum, he challenged the president on what was happening in Bosnia. He, right. he uh, dealt with the events in Yugoslavia. He, in fact, tried a mediating role, uh, right. which, which was a failed, uh, a failed role. So he, um, I'm not sure, he, he, he did not, he was afraid that comparisons meant equivalences. And he was deeply, deeply opposed to equivalences. And again, he was on both sides of the issue in his utterances. Correct. And the impression I had was that he was not in control of the process. The process was in control of him. These conflicting emotions his greatness as a human being that he really cared about other people and his overwhelming commitment to the uniqueness of the Holocaust, both vied for each other, with each other on a cellular level inside of him. And you never knew which side of his mouth was going to speak next. Uh, if, if I may, uh, I would like to go back to 
the role of Turkey or Ottoman Empire vis-a-vis -vis the Jews. Uh, and I've done extensive research on this subject and others have. The, uh, at the time when Armenian genocide was going on, there was a decision by the Ottoman Empire to also carry out similar persecution and massacres against Jewish immigrants in, at the time, Palestine. And in fact, a lot of Jews, thousands of them were deported, removed from their homes, taken to, uh, to the deserts, and many of them perished. And ironically, the reason why that those killings and persecutions did not take a massive scale was the intervention of prominent Jews in Germany with the German government to ask that their ally at the time, the Ottoman Empire, seize the persecution of Jews. And it's, it's uh, irony of history that in World War I, the Germans intervened to stop the killing of Jews. And in World War II, they do the exact opposite. This is very ironic in terms of uh, turnaround in history. I'm going to take the opportunity to thank you, Harut and Michael, for your joining me in tonight's conversation and your honoring the book. And as my closing contribution, I'd like to bring a fable from the 19th century where the lie, many of you know this, the lie, L-I-E, says to the truth, let's take a bath together. The water is very nice. And they got naked and bathed, but suddenly the lie leapt out of the water, leaped out of the water and fled and took the clothes of the truth. The truth was now naked, climbed out of the water furious and had to go back into the world as the naked truth. And in the meantime, the lie put on the truth's clothes and posed as the truth. And ever since then, the fable says, the world does not have a sufficient desire to know the real truth. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you, Matthew, for organizing this event. I think that's a perfect place to end. Um, so yes, we wanted to thank um, all three of you, Harus Sunian, Israel Charney, and Michael Barenbaum uh, for this engaging conversation. Uh, and for those who the Q&A and, and your chat comments didn't make it to uh, the, uh, the panelists, we'll make sure they get a copy of that as well. Um, and once again, uh, this has been recorded. Uh, it will be made available to everybody. Uh, a link will be sent out. Um, but thank you very much for joining and um, we hope to see everybody soon. Thank you. Good evening, Israel and uh, good afternoon, Arut. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Parting is sweet sorrow. Bye. <laughs>